Welcome to the Lindsay Year Symposium. This is a symposium in which we're exploring the innovations and changes that were made during the years that John Lindsay was mayor of the city of New York from 1966 to 1973. And the challenges and efforts that he undertook in order to make New York a livable city in a time that was quite tumultuous in the New York and the national history. I want to welcome you to this program and to join the program that's in progress. If you were watching the little PowerPoint presentation that was scrolling before we got started, you will notice the theme was about some of the innovations. And I can tell you the word some is an understatement of the word. The list of things that were undertaking during those eight years was enormous. That just was a sample. And one of the slides that was scrolling through was the effort by Howard Samuels at the request of the mayor to create OTB. Um, which was enormously successful, both in terms of its design, implementation, and what it was intended to do. And I think we're really quite fortunate this morning to have Ken Letter come to talk about that experience. Um, I don't need to give you a long introduction to Ken. You know him from his writings and as a reporter. You know him as his writings as an author. He was quoted yesterday in terms of uh, um, The Streets Were Paved in Gold is one of the books that were written about this period. When I was chairman of the City Club of New York, as I said to Ken, we used to wait to every December for Ken to come and do a presentation giving his kind of thoughts of what the new year was going to be like. And so it's a great pleasure to introduce Ken Oletta. Thank you, Stan. Uh, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to talk about Howard, um, who was my first job out of out of graduate school. Um, and I thought I'd actually begin by, by telling you about the experience of meeting Howard uh, and talk about Howard some, and then talk about how we wove together with John Lindsay. Um, I was a graduate student at the Maxwell School at Syracuse. Um, I was in a PhD program, and I was getting bored. And I thought, you know, I don't want to be a professor. And, and so the, the dean of the school uh, introduced me to Howard Samuels, and I had an interview on a Saturday morning. Uh, and I drove from Syracuse to, um, to his plant, which was outside of Canandaigua, which was his hometown. And I was in a, my Brooklyn best sharkskin black suit <laughs> and uh, tie, and I got to the guard at the gate. And he said, um, who are you here to see? And I said, I'm here to see Howard Samuels. He said, what's your name? And I told him my name. And he was standing outside a plant called Cordite. And Cordite was a, a plant that made plastic baggies, uh, which was one of the things Howard invented. It also used to make the plastic clothesline, which was also something he invented when he was an MIT engineering student. And so the, he dials the phone, the guard, and he says, hello, Howie? <laughs> and I'm stunned. He says, we have Ken here. Send him up. So I go up, and I'm greeted by this guy in, in dungarees, Saturday morning. And he said, uh, have you had any lunch? How about some lunch? So we walk into the cafeteria. One of the things you notice right away, no executive dining room. Everyone's seated at a communal dining table. And um, and everyone called him Howie. And it was quite stunning uh, to me. And so I went to work for Howie. I was a code holder. Um, I was an aide de camp. I was a speechwriter. Uh, and we traveled around the state, uh, 62 counties, as he ran for governor in 1966. Uh, he was a very cheap guy, um, which is actually relevant because he thought of his money the same way he thought about public money, which is that you don't spend it loosely. And we would, he would charter this little crate of a plane that I think was designed by Michelangelo or da Vinci. <laughs> and, um, and we would fly and land between telephone poles in Canandaigua at night. And, and, but, and I would listen to his management mess speech and his talk about productivity until I was blue in the face. Uh, I even tried to help him write some of it, but it didn't do much good. He insisted on talking about management and talking about things like the need for state 
Constitutional Convention, which is something that he'd be very proud to know his son uh, talked about in the past year as well. Um, I could recite from memory Howard's management speech. I could recite from memory all his talk about productivity. But I, I remember something else. I remember that people couldn't quite figure Howard out. He was a businessman who had a passion for making government more efficient, for saving wasted money so it could be spent on those in need, for tax incentives that would spur business to invest and create jobs, for public financing so that not just wealthy people but unions could not help elect and tilt elections in their favor. Much of this made liberals very nervous. Yet he had a feel for people that was missing for most corporate executives. He was an eloquent proponent of gender equality, of attacking poverty. And he was a reformer who wanted to transform the Democratic Party and the clubby conflict of interest world of Albany, which made the establishment very nervous. Howard championed the elimination of waste and bureaucracy before there was a Tea Party. When he entered government and headed the Small Business Administration in the Johnson Administration, he forged a private-public partnership with the banks and boosted minority business loans by 400%. Because he knew how to read a budget, he repeatedly warned of a city and state fiscal crisis before there was a fiscal crisis. He was a Democrat, but the Democratic Party was not his church. When Democrats nominated a conservative non-entity, Mario Procaccino in 1969, as their candidate for mayor, Howard was outraged. Although he planned to run for governor in 1970, the following year, as a Democrat, and some advisors cautioned him not to do it, he crossed party lines and became the first prominent Democrat to endorse John Lindsay for re-election. He became chairman of Democrats for Lindsay. The established Democratic Party did not forget. They opposed him when he ran for governor in 1970, and he narrowly lost to candidate Arthur Goldberg, where 21,000 votes would have changed that result. Soon after, the state legislature, with scant forethought, passed a bill allowing the city to establish the Off-Track Betting Corporation. They computed on the back of an envelope, literally, how much money they thought OTB would generate. Jim Kavanaugh, in fact, it was Jim Kavanaugh's envelope. Um, they did one thing right, however. Rather than establish OTB as a mayoral agency that might get bogged down in bureaucracy, Mayor Lindsay was granted freedom to establish OTB as a public corporation. He recruited a businessman to serve as its chairman and CEO. That businessman was Howard Samuels. Lindsay pledged to let Howard run it like a business, a pledge he honored. Howard did some other things wealthy men like Mayor Bloomberg have since done. He insisted on working for $1 a year. With Lindsay's backing and with the wise counsel of Deputy Mayor Richard Aurelio, who served on the OTB board, I think Howard Samuels in the city, in the Lindsay administration, did some extraordinary things. He set up a public bidding system for, computerized, for a computerized betting system, and within two years, they were automating $1 million OTB, one million, I'm sorry, one million OTB wagers. He opened 140 OTB parlors within a couple of years. He recruited business executives to run OTB. By the end of year one, OTB produced $17 million in profits. By year two, $42 million. By year three, $60 million. All earmarked for education. He maneuvered to keep unions with organized crime ties from organizing OTB workers. And working with Herb Sturz, then of the Vera Institute, in fact, the creator of the Vera Institute, who served in the Lindsay administration, 
He established four OTB offices that were operated by former drug addicts, ex-prisoners, and others seeking to reform themselves and start a new life. As his Cordite employees, and that was the name of his former company, came to call him Howie, the city came to call him Howie the Horse. Were there failings and mistakes at OTB and by Howard Samuels and John Lindsay? You betcha, as Sarah Palin would say. He tackled the racing interest by insisting they were getting too large a share of OTB's handle and by pushing to allow TV monitors in OTB parlors. He was right about that and actually was a, because he lost those fights and John Lindsay lost those fights, I think OTB later would pay a price for those losses. But when Howard Samuels left OTB in 1973 to run for governor the following year, OTB was in fact considered one of the Lindsay administration's many successes. No one anticipated that OTB would, three decades later, be deemed a failure. Blame it on politics, blame it on the legislature, blame it on frightened, reactionary, racing interests. Don't blame it on John Lindsay. In part because of his success at OTB, Howard was the heavy favorite for the Democratic nomination in 1974. He dared warn of hidden state and city deficits, warn that the city was careening towards bankruptcy, that the state had to tighten its belt and its fiscal oversight of New York. With my help, he went from a 20-point lead in the polls to a 20-point defeat <laughs> in the election. You Carey was, the, was nominated and went on to win the election that year. At the time, few anticipated that the Brooklyn congressman would, when confronted with economic reality, rise to the, the occasion and become the great governor he, in fact, did become. Howard was not a bitter man. Although he had run three times for governor and was never elected, he did leave a broad legacy. He was a new Democrat before that phrase invaded our language. Long before people like Mayor Bloomberg or President Obama took, took on teachers' unions, because too often they serve their own narrow interests rather than those of students and taxpayers. Before Democrats spoke of troubling deficits and choking debt service payments, Howard Samuels insisted that the true liberal position was to focus on those who receive government services, not those who provided them. Looking back on Howard's political career, one can say, perhaps, he was a failure. I would say that's wrong. Though he was not elected governor, he had a huge impact on the future shape of the Democratic Party. He was a pioneer in the belief that waste and management, mismanagement and fiscal responsibility were not issues owned by Republicans. Howard married both a good head with a good heart. He succeeded at something that is even harder, I think, than getting elected or building a business. He succeeded at being a good man. Thank you. I'd just like to know if you could talk a little bit about your dealings with Jim Cavanaugh after the creation of OTB and if he played any role. Yes, Jim, Jim Cavanaugh was on the board of OTB. Uh, and many people, uh, he liked to think of himself as the father of OTB. Um, and it's, in part, he was. In terms of, he was the man who helped shepherd the legislation through. Um, he was, uh, Jim was a charming guy, um, a budget expert. Um, or was claimed to be a budget expert. In fact, he wasn't. Um, if you go back, many of the numbers he was doing for the city uh, budget, which is where he was a senior budget official, were in fact, it, in retrospect, looks like they were done on the back of an envelope as well. Um, but he was, he was a nice, he was a good man, and, and, um, and he got along with Howard. I mean, what, did Howard, did, did we, and I was executive director of OTB, something that is often not mentioned when people introduce me. Um, um, did, Jim, w w 
we did not view Jim the way we, for instance, view Dick Aurelio, as, as, a, as a fellow reform-oriented person. Um, but, but we liked him. Uh, Ken, uh, you referred to uh, the fact that uh, Lindsay can't really be blamed for the things that befell OTB later. Would you talk a little bit about what did befall OTB? Uh, what went wrong from your perspective? Well, I think, you know, I, I think a number of things happened to OTB. One is that, that they were giving a larger and larger portion of the handle, uh, the money generated OTB to the, to the racing industry. Um, I think it, w it became loaded up with, um, with too many uh, political hacks, uh, and some of the people who were asked to run it uh, were not the kind of managers that, that, that Lindsey brought in when he brought in Howard Samuels. Um, I mean, ha at the time, Howard was accused of having a political operation. I was his campaign manager in 1974, so I was accused of being a politico. Um, but if you look at the executives that he brought in and the people who ran the place, I mean, it's hard to make that argument that it was dominated by, by politicians. Um, but in any case, um, I think it became so, and eventually, they opened too many offices, the offices became kind of slovenly, um, and I think all those factors contributed to, um, to its downfall. Yes, sir. Bob Newman, I was with uh, HSA. Um, I wonder how close the numbers that were written on the back of that envelope corresponded to the actual experience of OTB. They were, they were more optimistic than the actual experience, though people were surprised that OTB was able to generate $60 million within a couple of years of profit, uh, which is a pretty amazing achievement and considered so at the time. One of the reasons why Samuels was, was deemed the heavy favorite in the race for governor was because of the success he had at OTB. Thank you. I guess one of the classic Jim Cavanaugh behind the envelope stories is uh, when the banks decided that they were not gonna do another commercial paper issue and, and Walter Riston realized that there was something going on with the city, decided to go meet with Mayor Beam and, uh, and, Cav and Jim and brought his chief financial officer, and they had this whole discussion about what was going on. At some point, Riston asked the mayor, how many people work for the city? And Jim took out a card and rattled some number off. And, and the chief financial officer of Citibank was standing to his side and looked over his shoulder at the card, and it was blank, and said, there's nothing on the card. And Jim said, right, because I have no idea how many people work here. And that set a whole tone for the bank's perception of what they were now in for. We have spent all of yesterday and this morning looking at the innovations and challenges that the Lindsay administration both undertook and faced during the late 60s through the early 70s. And in a sense, the whole point of the two-day symposium isn't just about retrospectively looking at what happened there. It's really to try to understand what happened there, what do we learn from that period, how has that influenced what we kind of do today, and the directions in which we're headed. And so over the, the rest of the panel today and right now is really to take a look at what's going on now, and even in some ways try to project a little forward of the kind of challenges that we face um, both the years ahead and even after when the, the mayor is no longer the current mayor. We have the, whoever the next mayor becomes. And so it's, uh, I think, quite helpful and quite appropriate that our next speaker uh, is Jeffrey Kay, who's currently the chief operating officer at Muse Development, a real estate development company. Jeff is here not for his real estate participation, but because he was the director of the mayor's office of operations, and that office in some ways, there are some loose ties between the productivity program that started during the Lindsay years and the Mayor's Office of Operations, which really didn't come into formal, I guess, existence until, was it the, I guess, the Koch years, and it became part of a charter um, reform. He has had, had great responsibility at reforming of the city's graffiti cleanup efforts, streamlining processes to identify street defects and repairs, and you have the, the bio in here. Most important, I think he has a very clear sense 
and I was quite impressed when he and I met for the first time this summer about the efforts that the Blumberg administration has attempted to craft over its first two plus terms in office and a real sense of, of how management and data drive each other and the kind of insights about the, the challenges the city is facing, the current mayor faces. So it's my great pleasure to invite Jeffrey Kay um, to the podium. Jeff, thank you. You know, one of the one of the things I heard Stan mention earlier, or, or, or Jay probably said the same thing, is government is cyclical, and a lot of things that were put in place 30, 40 years ago sort of come back. Um, anytime we had a new idea, the first question is, well, did we do it before, and can we learn from it? And most of the time, it was tried or done before. But now with new technology and, and, and different approaches, uh, hopefully things have progressed just a little bit farther. And I think that happens every time someone comes in in government. You should always learn from what's, be what's before you. You know, this is actually a perfect time for me personally to try to look back at what was done in the Bloomberg years in, in terms one and ter term two as I'm trying to figure out, as someone that just recently left the public sector the, in private sector, is what can I bring? And, you know, a lot of people say government's very different than the private sector, and anything that you learn really doesn't relate to that. But in reality, the opposite is true, because a lot of the things that we learned, a lot of the, the management techniques and the management styles that uh, were imported in terms one and term two came from the private sector. And, and flipping that back to where I am now is actually much easier than I had anticipated. Um, obviously a little bit smaller, uh, a little different product, but some, a lot of the same performance management tools uh, are, are definitely used. So what I thought I wanted to do is just give you a little bit of an overview of some of the themes and the principles of effective management that were employed during the first two terms. There's obviously some similarities from what I've heard and read about Lindsay and from what Jay Kriegel has drilled into my head over the last several years. Um, but there's certainly some new variations. Like technology is there to take it to new heights. Let me give you a little bit more on my background. And I, the reason why I do that is to give you from my perspective. Uh, in the first term, actually, I was in the Office of Management and Budget. I was a deputy budget director responsible for education as well as intergovernmental relations. So I saw not only city government and management and working with people in City Hall, but I was able to see the perspective from state government as well over the last several years. In the second term, I was the director of the Mayor's Office of Operations. Uh, we recreated what we branded as agency services, which was performance management teams, project management teams, uh, and we also created a new office of Office of Sustainability, which focused on Plan YC, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. But in that role at operations, really got a chance to look at all the different points of data throughout the city. And towards the end of the second term, we actually brought 311 into that office. 311 started within the Department of Information Technology, and the natural progression um, over time was, in fact, to bring it into the mayor's office, because that's the office that's looking at the information, that's looking at the data. Um, on a truly analytical case rather than just the service, service side of it, and I could talk about that as well. You know, in order to discuss the culture of innovation and some of the strong princi principles that were employed, if you had to summarize, there's probably three words. It's transparency, accessibility, and accountability. No particular order. We always used to argue, you know, this innovation supports transparency, and this one accessibility, you try to move it around, it turns out they sort of blend. What fits one, one idea fits probably all three in, in some way. What does that actually mean? How does that improve effective government management? And the short answer is sunlight makes people perform better. Too many of government decisions were always done in back doors or done behind, you know, behind purple cloths, clandestine discussions out in the back about what's going on. Agencies would tell stories three different ways just to show what's in their best light. The mayor always said that the public needed to see what they signed up for. They voted for a chief executive officer. They hired a chief executive officer in the, in the voting booth. And the managers within the administration needed to be held accountable. And the only way to do that is through sunlight. So we created a culture and a government organization where those principles were paramount. And those were seen through a lot of different uh, management projects and ideas. There's so many things, obviously, that went in the first eight years. I'm only going to talk about a couple and give you a couple of examples. Um, but you know, effective government management probably shouldn't change too much in good times or in bad. But it is important to look at what's going on uh, within the local economy and what faces the city and what pressures were faced, because that gives you a little bit different perspective of, of what people were thinking. You know, in January 2002, 
The city was faced with a big fiscal crisis, a fiscal crisis not of its making. Obviously, the September 11th attacks impacted New York City far greater than anyone else throughout the country. So there really was a very localized impact. Within weeks of the mayor taking office, there was a $5 billion budget gap. $5 billion, you hear that every, you know, here or there. This was a real $5 billion budget gap, and that was already the middle of January, and we were truly facing that, and the local economy completely went, went, went down. Um, frankly, it probably could have been a lot worse if not for fiscal management prior. It really wasn't of the city's own making. Ultimately, the task to close that big budget gap and the budget gap that followed required significant federal aid, temporary borrowing, permanent and temporary local taxation, and significant agency reductions. And that ultimately put government, government management to the test. You know, I'm sure administrations throughout history can always use the term do more with less. And some people say it's overused over the last eight years and prior to that. But the reality is, without fundamental principles and change, you can't do more with less. This was an opportunity to actually accomplish that. And there were a couple of things and a couple of immediate changes to the culture and to the management of, of city government and city agencies that took place to try to instill those principles of transparency, accountability, and accessibility. The first one's sort of obvious, and people even question whether it's a truly management reform or not, or was it just sort of a personal um, view of what an office should look like. I'm sure it's been debated many times, but you know the reality is the bullpen was a tremendous change in the way government interacted just within City Hall and throughout the agencies. It basically symbolized the need for transparency and accessibility. They were literally tearing down the walls throughout the government offices. People were able to talk to people in real time as things were happening. If it was urgent, everyone was there. A lot of people have said, you know, when I talk to people that I was in government outside of New York City, is well, well, how close do you sit to so and so? Because the old adage was, the closest you are to the mayor, the closest you are to the chief executive, the more powerful you have. This totally turned that concept on its head. Not only was government going to be more accessible to the public, but the chief executive was going to be more accessible to the managers, and that ultimately held us all more, much more accountable. I knew when I walked into the door to talk to two or three other people in that bullpen, that at any particular point, the mayor can ask me 10 different questions about 10 different things. And frankly, you wanted to be ready for all of them, so you're always on your toes. And that, hap that same went for all the deputy mayors and other managers within City Hall as well, because at any one point, you were there, you were going to be approached. Ultimately, that doesn't just promote accountability, but I have to tell you, it also promotes the ability to find talent. And I was a true beneficiary of that. It allows you to find that person around you that actually knows what they're talking about. And, and you don't have those walls that separate where you are in the particular pecking order. The key is to find out the information, get it accurate, get it right, and get it fast. Um, you know, with that, that, without that open attitude of the people in and around the mayor at the time, I certainly wouldn't be here today or within, you know, where I'm going to be going in my career. So finding talent was another big piece um, of, I think, the mayor's goals to reforming government. And another way to do that is to look at how the government was organized and how the mayor's office interacted with the various agencies. Obviously, there were tough budget times, tough fiscal constraints. So in that time, usually the budget office has a whole lot of power. I think a lot of people today will say the budget office has a whole lot of power. But I think what was unique is the mayor went out and tried to find the best people to manage the city agencies, looked across the country to find that. So one question is, if I just hired the best manager in the world to manage that organization, why do I need to micromanage it? Why does the budget office, what budget analyst is going to be there to suggest you need to do A, B, C, or D? So what that really does is gives the agency commissioners enormous amount of flexibility, the flexibility in order to achieve those goals. But that flexibility came with a very, very heavy price, and that's obviously accountability, coming in on budget and producing results. It also allowed the administration to focus on making very tough decisions that are presented through the eyes of that expert, not someone necessarily within the mayor's office. That's how a lot of decisions, I think, frankly, get met. Um, I'm sure politics didn't decide that we should ban smoking throughout the city. That really came from data and, re and push and research from the health commissioner, because that was his job, which was to present the actual facts. That created the culture of innovation within the agency. If you wanted to run the agency, you had the ability to do that. But you better come in on budget, and you had to be able to produce those results. And one of the things that the mayor's office really needed to have was information and data 
on those results. And two things happened, I think, in that first few years that typified how you were going to hold your agency commissioners accountable. That was completely reforming the MMR, and second was 311. I'll talk a few minutes about those two right there. The mayor's management report, as you all know, uh, was required by charter, and over the years became pretty voluminous. In fact, when, I, when we first went in there uh, in, in term one, the MMR was three or four different volumes, was literally three to 4,000 pages long, and in order to find any data, you had to lead through probably 15 to 20 pages per section of each particular agency. Um, and reforming that to just three pages per agency that really focused out the critical objectives, the key public service areas, and frankly, a data report made it much easier for the general public, made it much easier for any of the managers in city government to look and see exactly what was going on and were those agencies producing results. It was brought down to a 200-page document that still exists today. It was still done two times, still done two times a year, but it's a much more easy and readable document. And in fact, when it was first done in 2002, it was brought down to the neighborhood level, which wasn't necessarily done before. You can look at any particular community board in the city and get a real snapshot of what data was going on on the community level, and you can do it online, and it was easily accessible. 301, you know, you could talk forever about 301. It certainly was transformative and still is in city government. Cities from across the world come to New York all the time. Um, I've done many of the tours myself over the last couple of years. They want to see what was accomplished. And if you can accomplish 301 in New York, you can accomplish it anywhere. Was 311 New York's idea? Not necessarily. It was done prior, but nothing was done in so scope, with such scope and such scale um, as was done in New York City. It literally brought the city government to people's fingertips. Everyone really knew th what 311 was. They knew what they can call. They would call to complain. They would call to get information. They would call to get service. That was a great public service. But what was even better is now the mayor's office knew exactly what the people wanted and what they needed. It also knew in one place how quickly agencies would respond, how long it took to get something done. There were always issues of data collection and the type of information the agencies put into the 311 system and whether they actually closed that service quickly or not. But now agencies were finally being held accountable. Not only did the mayor have it at his fingertips, but the 311 reports were put out online to the public once a month, and they're still done today. Certainly can't talk about the first, time, first term about um, government management without at least mentioning the Board of Education and mayoral control. Jay Kriegel talked a lot about the MTA being sort of the stepchild of accountability. Of course, mayors throughout history have wanted mayoral control of the school system. Um, for whatever particular reason, Albany at that point in time decided to move over mayoral control. The reason why I bring it up is because it really set up a system where city managers throughout government said, you know what, if the mayor was willing to put a price on his head, which was I want to take over mayoral control and I really want to do it, and you know what, you're going to judge me on that. I'm going to be held accountable to that. Putting himself out there made it so much more difficult for any city agency commissioner, mid-level manager to say, I want to shirk my responsibility as well. So really putting himself out there um, really changed that culture and fostered the innovation without the city, throughout the city. Um, that kind of culture also went beyond the police department of data and collecting data of Comstat went through all different agencies. In fact, the Department of Homeland Services went out to the city streets to start counting the homeless people, which was unheard of in collecting data. So people really wanted to, to take that next step and move forward. In that first term, there was such budget crisis. Agencies were given such flexibility um, to move and to move in that direction. They had a cut and they cut and they cut. The mayor's office had the ability to look and see if they were producing results and actually meeting their budget on time. After the fiscal crisis, and you look at the evolution of that first term, which was all about data collection, all about holding agencies accountable and cutting to the bone within their agencies, you saw, sort of saw a shift. Obviously, there was the closing of the, the firehouses, everyone heard, closing of senior centers, and you had to make really, really tough decisions that by the time the second term came around, there was enough money where the city really had the ability to start looking to the future, looking to the future and creating an agenda to deal with growth over the next 25, 30 years. Agencies still had to make those peg reductions, and I'm sure they were still saying OMB was making all the decisions for them, but everyone knew the city's economy wouldn't be rosy forever, and they had a plan for that growth. So if you had to describe management in the second term, I don't think it was very different. Um, I think it 
was a little bit of an evolution, building on the data collection with a whole bunch of new data collection tools, which I'll talk about in a minute. But there was a rethinking of the mission across different agencies. One of the main roles of operations in the Office of Operations was to deal with multi-agency issues. And I think you saw that, frankly, on steroids in the second term in a number of different areas, getting the agencies to work together to achieve common goals. Three large accomplishments come to mind when I think about that. The first one is Plan YC, 2030. The second was, uh, second and the third under the leadership of Deputy Mayor Linda Gibbs was HHS Connect and the Commission for Economic Opportunity. Each of them shared the basic principles of forgetting politics and the conventional way of doing things, understanding common missions and goals amongst the agencies, using data to analyze the decision making, and frankly, taking advantage of the private sector for ideas. Each one of them really counted on the not-for-profit sector and counted on people outside of government for new innovative approaches to, ha to how to approach common problems. Plan YC was a comprehensive look at the city's built infrastructure. The project took two years to develop. It focused on the environment, focused on transportation and mobility, housing, energy. But what was striking about all these policy proposals, and people could debate congestion pricing or energy benchmarking or bikes or closing a Broadway to the tilt, everything was supported in data. In order to have anything put within that plan, you had to have it modeled. You had to say exactly why you were doing that. And frankly, if you were able to present that case, forget the politics, we were able to move it forward. And you were able to create an agenda and create momentum in order to move those policy decisions along. The plan set 10 goals. 20 agencies worked together to set those 10 goals. Those goals were set not just at the top. In fact, it wasn't top down at all. It was bottom up. Agencies worked for two years together, mid-level managers brainstorming, analyzing, coming up with those ideas, and they all basically agreed to those 10 goals. And they all agreed on everything after that. And if you look at every project and every implementation of what's in Plan YC, everything has to go back to those 10 goals and everything has to be quantifiable to show did it happen, did it not happen. So setting up that format of the common goal across agencies and holding ourselves accountable was, was, was extremely important to moving it forward. And allowing the agencies to be involved in creating that gave them ownership over the particular issue. And you can hear, you can see within the agency for years they were talking about, well, we need to do A, B, C, and D, and that's what we do at HPD. The, the, the lexicon changed a little bit. We need to do A, B, C, and D because that's what Plan YC should do. And they really owned it. They really had a piece of that. HHS Connect was similar in that it was collecting data like we did in the first term within 311 and within the MMR and, and new indicators, but it was taking data across the social services agencies to create sort of a virtual caseworker file that everyone can have access to. So you can imagine agencies on their own systems, on their own data systems, collecting their own information. Someone can come in there and enter the same information six, seven, or eight times. Now you could do it once, and agencies would share that information just like a virtual case file where ACS, Children's Services, would be looking at something, Department of Homeless Services would be looking at something else, and HRA would be looking at something else. So that fundamentally shifted how the agencies uh, viewed each other. It literally tore down those lines and the collection of data. And then finally, the Commission of Economic Opportunity uh, was out there as very similar to Plan YC in that it took the private sector approach to reducing uh, poverty and, and increasing economic opportunity. It was set aside outside of government. It was a sort of private, public-private partnership of innovation. Since it wasn't primarily used with city dollars, it raised a lot of private dollars to do that, you were able to try new ideas. One of those was conditional cash transfers that were talked about, you know, paying people in order for, their, for, to, in order for them to get their benefits and to actually move, in order to actually do the work that they needed to do. Um, that Center for Economic Opportunity was all based in data. You could try things new, you'd get that private money to try the new program, but ultimately, if it worked, you had to show that it worked. And everything was put in a computer algorithm to show, did you move the, did you move the ball or did you not? Sometimes things worked, sometimes things didn't work. But you created that innovation hotbed, separate and aside, and things that worked were then moved into mainstream government. And hopefully what you did was able to convince everyone you can use city dollars for it. Data was the key, and I promised Dan I would talk a little bit more about data 
and there were a bunch of different tools that we took over the last four years to collect as much information as we can, besides the th 311 and the MMR. In fact, after four years, we changed the MMR once again. We included 40% more outcome indicators. What I mean by outcome indicators is, you know, we used to be able to count how many inspections the building department used to do. We never used to actually count how many fatalities there were as a result of buildings falling down. The buildings department historically would say, I have nothing to do with that, it's outside factors. But ultimately, the buildings department role is to keep people safe from, from buildings. Um, and so, even though they were not completely responsible, they had to move those triggers. And so that was the type of data that we collected and find ways to move it um, to lower those numbers. Traffic fatalities was, was another good example. The Department of Transportation sometimes had a hard time saying, I should be responsible for traffic accidents. Well, it's a combination of the police department and the Department of Transportation. And it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a factor of something beyond government's control. But frankly, prevention and they can do things to reduce that number had them own, and had them own the outcome a, a little bit more. So we worked with every single agency and frankly we whiteboarded once again people that had nothing to do with the agency and said what do you as general public want to get from the Department of Transportation? What do you want? We took the whiteboard, we wrote it all down as general public, worked with the agency, and you came to a common ground and a whole new set of indicators, and frankly, zeroed it in on what we call critical indicators. So even though agencies had 50 to 100 or 150 different metrics, now each agency has about anywhere between five and 15 critical indicators that are looked at on a daily and a monthly basis that are now published online called citywide performance reports. We frankly called the Bloomberg terminal for city government. You can go on right now onto the internet and see those critical indicators. You can see how they did this month, how they did last month. You can see how they did over the last five years. And it's done in such a way where everyone gets a red, yellow, or green. You don't want to hide it. It's right out there. If you're red, if you're worse, if you're performing, if your agency is performing, I don't want to use the term worse. If, if the agency is performing less than they did the prior year, it shows red or it shows yellow if it's close. So putting out there, putting out that sunlight really made a big difference. In fact, when I first put together that program, I went to all the agency commissioners. I said, you know, we're really gonna do something different. The MMR comes out twice a year. Um, we need to get something out there. And we created this Bloomberg terminal for city government. I went around and I said, you know, these are the new indicators we're gonna do, and it's gonna be red, yellow, green. And I literally went to every commissioner and brought it to them, because we wanted them to use it. In order to get the commissioners on board, frankly, I had to convince them that this was an internal document. This document was not gonna be made public, it was gonna be done so we can manage within city government. If you have new ideas or new indicators, let's try it, um, but it's all internal. So probably after a year and a half of us doing it, I went to a senior staff meeting at Gracie Mansion, and we sat down, we briefed the mayor who just looked at me and said, you know, so when's it going public? I said, well, he asked two questions. One was who's being the biggest pain in the rear? about giving us the information, which was a tough one to give up. But the second one is, when are we going public? Frankly, my answer was, well, you know, the term ends in a year and a half. You know, we figured we'll get it up and running at that point. And he said, you know, it's gonna go public in a month. So I had to go back to every agency commissioner and say, look, I promise you it wouldn't go public, but at the end of the day, it wasn't up to me. The agency commissioners sort of, they knew what they got in for, right? They were given that flexibility. They were given free reign in order to move the ball and produce results, they knew they had to be held accountable. I think they all cringed a little bit, but at the end of the day, they all now look at it. Every single month when I was there, they would call up and say, look, this is the reason why it's red or this is the reason why it's yellow. And that's because you're putting it out there to the public. Um, 311, 311 was very based on how much information you get from people calling in. And a lot of times, you know, not everyone uses 311. Some use it occasionally, some use it five, 10, 15 times a day. And there are those faces and those voice recognitions. And 311 is this person calls 10 times a day. Um, but one of the things that Mary wanted to do is why do I have to wait for them to call me? I wanna go out there and I wanna find those problems. And so what we did was we took 12, we had team 12 to 15, what we called scout drivers. They would go out there in these little carts. And frankly, we used an, uh, electric cars actually as a pilot over the last two years. They'd take a Blackberry and they would drive every single city street twice a month. We had it mapped, I knew exactly where those driver was going to be, and they would log in any incident or any infraction that they saw, whether it was garbage on the street, a traffic light out, tree limbs that need to be pruned, 
you know, an overflowing waste basket, and they would hit the button. It would automatically go into 311. So we had more information. But what was even better about that is it was a controlled information. How many people call up and say you got overflow waste basket and who knows if it really is overflow waste basket? We knew if we logged in that incident, we knew exactly what we were saying, and frankly, we took pictures of it. That pothole, we took pictures of it. We needed to know, is it getting into the system? We were also able to go back at the end of the month and do an audit. What did they tell the customer? Because the agencies didn't know if it was us putting in that 3 on one incident or the public. It all went directly into the database. So we found, and potholes is a good example, we would look up, okay, we put in this incident and this pothole at this corner, where is it? We look in the system, and for those that have used 3 on one you can go look online and see if the government responded to your request. And it would say, DOT, the incident's closed. We'd send the guy out and see the same pothole, and we didn't know why. DOT was saying, it's closed, it's not my issue. We'd go to something else that's not a pothole. One thing that I learned in this process is there's no such thing as a pothole. There's a pothole, there's you know, an open water sewer, there's, there's hummocks, there's all different types of what you call potholes. And frankly, the Department of Transportation was not responsible for all of them. So what we turned out, what happened, is the Department of Transportation would say it was closed because they said it wasn't me. I referred to the Department of Environmental Protection. Well, we'd go to the Department of Environmental Protection and it would say they were closed. Because at that point, Department of Environmental Protection said, it's not me, it's Department of Transportation. The public saw that it was closed. There was nothing in any of the routing systems because it went back and forth. When we finally got to the bottom of it, it turned out that there were two people in each agency that every once in a while would fax the information back and forth. This was two years ago. So through and one not only gave us the information of what people want and where to get it, but we found out real problems in the system. We found out that five different agencies were involved in cleaning up graffiti. That had to change. We only found that by looking at the 301 data and looking at the end of the day, hey, we logged in that 301, why isn't it cleaned? And I know one month, two months, three months, what's going on here? So you had a whole new wealth of data in order, in order to delve into and solve problems. And at operations, we had a consulting group internally that helped those agencies solve that. And we really streamlined a whole number of city uh, services in order to meet the public's demand. In addition to that, we decided to go out to customers in many different ways. We did a citywide customer satisfaction survey. We sent out 100, over 100,000 um, surveys, some would call it a poll, but it was a more detailed survey that we did with the Fund for the City of New York, which really looked by community board. We had a statistical sample, um, over, over 300 per community board would rate city services. So what good is that? We took that information, worked with the agencies, and said this is what the city expects and the perception. Good idea of that is the scorecard system. Scorecard, probably remember, has been around for 30 years, um, where the Department of Sanitation, people within the Office of Operations drive around and they say, is this city street clean or is it not? Sanitation was getting 95s, 96s, 97s. If you ask the public what they felt, they would rate it as 70s or 80s. It's not that the city streets weren't cleaner. They were certainly cleaner. But the public's perception of what they should be had changed over the years. They expected a lot more out of city government. So when I left, I can't say it's been changed now. I actually don't know. We were working with the Department of Sanitation to change the rating system in a way to reflect public's perception of what they expect from city government. And so reaching out to the customer was much different. We also employed secret shoppers. There were over 630 walk-in facilities where you interact with city government. People think 301 is the, you know, the, the frontline interaction, but there are over 630 walk-in centers. So one summer, we sent over 50 people. A lot of them were interns, public file. I did a whole number of them myself. We walked into city government. We walked in and said, can I get this information? And we rated them on what signage, was it easy to see? How could you pay? Was it polite? Was there language access if I didn't speak English? Was there graffiti on the walls? And we literally went to every single agency and we had every single walk-in facility. And now they're doing that every two years. So it was a way to really focus on customer service. And we provided agency by agency reports to the commissioner and say, you may not know this, but this is what we got. So collecting more data, collecting the information, having the individual one-on-one um, -on -one interactions out there in the field made a tremendous difference to the frontline customer service. At the end of that, with that information, 
working with the agencies. We brought all the agencies in, like I talked about with Plan YC, people were involved. Every agency had a customer service liaison. They created benchmarks per agency, and they shared ideas about how to get things done. And there's now uniform signage standards, uniform language access, the way queuing systems are now done in all the walk-in facilities should be exactly the same because they should learn from each other. So we went out there, we collected the information, we showed them proof that it exists and said, we're not here to beat you over the head, we're here to work together collaboratively to find out ways to make it better. Because frankly, we'll learn one thing from one agency, one from another, and one from another. At the end, you get a full package. So it was through this combination of metrics, shared services, working together, using the private sector, using private money to do innovation that I think really defined the culture um, and the management style in the first two terms. What does that mean for the third term? I, I would suggest a few things. The first term, if it was defined by doing more with less, in each agency silo, doing as efficiently as you possibly can. In the second term, continuing to do more with less, getting those agency pegs, but working together to move forward towards their mission, that now is an opportunity to look at inefficiencies within and across agencies. The Department of Health and mental hygiene shouldn't have to worry about how to maintain their fleet of cars. Department of Probation shouldn't have to worry about their real estate holdings. There's a lot of administrative functions where you can get support across agencies. Human resources, the Human Resources Administration. And these are areas that I know the city is already pursuing in order to find savings because those agencies can then focus on their core services. So they don't have to worry about administrative functions. And not only can you get savings from that perspective, but you can be a lot more efficient and use a lot more technology in the field in order to produce results. How will that eventually go to the bottom line from a budget scenario? I think that's what remains to be seen. But it also allows the administration to focus on a lot of the long-term structural problems of the pensions, the debt service, and a lot of other administrative functions across the agencies. So that's just a flavor of a couple different um, programs uh, and basically the culture and the innovation the culture of innovation that was instituted for the last eight years. Often when we, we come up with these metrics and ways of driving decisions and holding people accountable by data, we, we sometimes end up producing unintended consequences because people want to end up looking good. How, how in the course of bringing this into the agencies, was there steps taken to ensure that, in fact, what wasn't getting produced was kind of the reverse kind of behavior, people kind of doing the wrong thing in order to look good? Uh, and then I guess the second part, having, having begun to shift the culture, how does one get it adopted so that when this administration is gone, this then becomes the new way of thinking how we do business so it doesn't just become a part of the Blumberg legacy and then whatever happens next week's like reinvent the wheel again? Right. Um, I'm going to go back to my pothole example of agencies trying to create metrics that work the best for them that probably shows it in a different light. For years, the pothole metric was how many potholes were fixed within 30 days? 70%, 80%, 90%. Three years ago, it was 99.9%. And it was great. Department of Transportation said, I fill all my potholes within 30 days. What we did and what we changed was, I don't actually care if you fill it in 30 days. What's the actual average time? What's the actual number of days it takes to fill it? And that metric changed from how many, how many, how many potholes are filled within 30 days, which was 99%, to what's the average time to fill a pothole, which was 2.4 days. We completely changed the dynamic that when the Department of Transportation the following year went red, because they were doing it in three and a half days, they went crazy. <laughs> They said, how am I held to this new standard? So it wasn't a new standard. We're constantly pushing the ball forward. That was one of the things that you'll see on the citywide performance report, which is the online red, yellow, and green, was what's the target? The MMR requires by charter, and this is debated all the time, a target. And it's supposed to be based on their budget. What number are you going to hit? And what you're supposed to say is, you know, I'm going to get all my potholes done within 30 days versus 45, and you should be judged against the target. Well, that creates all sorts of problems because, frankly, the agency set the target themselves. And so you have that constant push of, well, wait a minute, you've hit your target five times out of the last six. I'm changing your target. And you'd push that ball forward. So the setting of targets was very, very arbitrary and very difficult. 
What we did with red, yellow, and green was we didn't set targets, only on case-by-case -case basis. We measured you against last year's performance. That's good and that's bad. Like I said, you could be, last year could have been a banner year, and this happens a lot with the police department. It was a banner year the, the year prior, and the next year you're the second best year you've had in 30 years. It shows up as red. Well, that's a problem. But maybe not. You should always be looking to get better. So we constantly had those battles with the particular agencies. Your second question, which is, how do we instill the culture moving forward? Um, a lot of it was instilled not just at the commissioner level, but within the mid-level manage management level. Um, a couple of strategies that we did, I'll use Plan YC as an example, I was, just, I was much more intimately involved in that one, is Plan YC, when we put it out there, is, is a very large document with policy ideas. And we were putting it together. One of the key questions was, is this going to be a Bloomberg legacy? Is this going to be a Bloomberg document, or is it going to be a city document? We released um, Plan YC on Earth Day in 2006. That was a Sunday. On Monday, we had every single good government group, real estate board, partnership, not-for-profit organization on the city steps endorsing the plan because it was their plan. We had been working with them for three or four months prior to that incorporating their ideas, I'd say even longer than that, five or six months, incorporating their ideas, really saying it's not about us because a lot of these things aren't going to be implemented in the next three or four or five or six years. They're going to, they're long-term goals. It's by reaching 2030. So you needed it to last. So by putting a, the sunlight, by putting it out there, you got to have the, the, the community f hold the next mayor accountable for all, for all of that. The MMR does that. Putting it online does that. 301 does that. Putting yourself out there and making this more than just uh, the administration's product is an enormously powerful tool. Um, you know, we did a lot of things in Plan YC that require the next administration to do things. Well, we all know a third term, now the mayor has to do them, but it was very, very strict. They've got to relook at, at Plan YC again every four years. And, you know, you create an advisory board with a lot of different not-for-profit organizations, and they don't let you forget. The League of Conservation Voters to this day turns and says, I know what you said. You put it out there. I've got it on paper. I'm holding you accountable. And so that still happens. This is the conclusion of this segment of the Lindsay Year Symposium, in which we've been looking at innovations that were introduced into the operation of New York City government from 1966 to 1973. This symposium is being held at Baruch College, and I look forward to seeing you when we return for the next installment of this symposium.